I can see that it's been called. That's great. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our webinar on Dying at Home, A Good Place to Die. This is the last for me in a series of webinars for Thames Valley Wellbeing Network for Dying Matters Awareness Week. And um, I've actually started a new job, so <laughs> that's why it's the last one for me. But uh, we'll make sure that the recording is made available to you all. Do put into the chat box where you're from. Um, be really interesting to know if you're based at a care home or if you're listening in uh, with a group of other staff somewhere that's helpful for us. I'm going to introduce the panel now. So uh, panel members, if you can uh, just make sure you're unmuted when I introduce you, that'd be really great. So you can say hello, we can check that you, you're able to chip in. So first of all, Dr. Ben Gooch is a GP at Manor Surgery. Ben? Hello, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a GP here up in Headington and um, I have the pleasure of looking after Headington Care Home, which has quite a significant number of um, patients in the sort of final months and years of their life. So um, palliative care is definitely something that I work with regularly. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Ben. It's lovely. Jane Probert from Dementia Oxfordshire. Hi, everyone. I'm a manager with Dementia Oxfordshire and I'm mainly based in East Oxford in the city. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Esther Ramsey Jones from Nettlebed Hospice, who ride a care. Um, yeah, I'm Esther. I work as um, a palliative psychotherapist in what is now South Oxfordshire Palliative Care Hub. Um, my background is actually in, in care homes and um, I did a substantial piece of research um, looking at the relational field in dementia care homes. Um, and I also lecture in death, dying and bereavement. So um, I'm delighted to be here because I think it's so important to um, try to have some honest conversations about the experience of death and dying. So thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. So and I'm Rhonda Riachi. As I said, I, I was manager of the Thames Valley Wellbeing Network based at Oxford Brookes University. My new job now is at the Centre for Ageing Better, who are based in London, um, looking after the network of age-friendly communities. So I'm just here in a personal capacity today to, to help out the network. And Min, Min Stackpool, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm retired. But I worked for 20 years at St Christopher's Hospice as a um, community specialist palliative care nurse um, and my particular interest was in um, palliative care for people with dementia and particularly working with care homes and um, I was the nurse researcher on the St Christopher's um, Namaste Care Programme study so um, yeah it's excellent Sorry. and I, I currently um, I, I, I work with an organisation called Namaste Care International. So that's a contact. Lovely. Thanks, Min. And uh, also joining us today is Dr Jane Bywater from Sue Rider Care. Jane? Well, thank you, Rhonda. It's actually lovely to be here. And I think the fact we've got so many people interested in this topic suggests it's a very well chosen and pertinent thing to be spending time talking about. Um, my role is as a consultant in palliative medicine. Um, I cover across South Oxfordshire, working with Esther in the um, community service that now is Sue Ryder runs in the south of Oxfordshire. And I also work across West Berkshire, um, also for Sue Ryder and for the Royal Barks, um, delivering care mostly in people's homes. So I'm fundamentally a community um, palliative care consultant. Great. Thank you very much, Jane. Um... So um, without further ado, let's go into just a, a couple of short presentations and we'll pick up questions as we go along. Um, thank you for those who sent questions in advance. So I'm going to introduce Esther Ramsey-Jones now, who will talk about the Sue Ryder services for people dying at home. Over to you, Hello. Esther. Okie dokes. Well, thank you. I mean, it's good to good to represent uh, Sue Ryder here, and I'm sure Jane will chip in um, as a more experienced colleague um, working for Sue Ryder, um, if if needs be. Um, and we'll be delighted to ask ask questions. So this is really just a, an overview of where we're at in Sue Ryder in in South Oxfordshire. So 
I wonder if I can move the slides, Rhonda, or can I not? I'll move them for you. Okay. Well, let, so this is just really an int brief introduction to um, what's available um, through our services. Okie do. So, so we support people um, with a terminal illness, um, and we work with those who are bereaved following the, the death of a partner, a parent, or a sibling. Um, we've sort of, I, I suppose, if we're thinking about things in terms of strap lines, we've, we've got three, palliative care, uh, neurology, and bereavement services. Um, we have, uh, we work in, you know, I guess what's happened is we've moved from an actual hospice provision, um, you know, a 12 bedded hospice where people could obviously come and stay and all the services would be in this one space. And we've moved into a sort of community hub and we're trying, well, it's, it's sort of it reasonably in its infancy, but we are constructing what we would describe as a sort of virtual ward. So the same multidisciplinary team is still in existence and we're working, you know, along with the kind of model of total pain that Cicely Saunders would have envisaged uh, back in the 60s and 70s for palliative care. So, so our approach is to um, respond to the spiritual, uh, the psychological um, medical um, and social needs of, of of the people that we're working with. Um, you know, we've. Um, I think that's 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 really what we're doing. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> so. Oh, I've already yes. said that. Um, so I guess what, what do our services comprise of? Um, we have a, a home care service, um, occupational therapy and physiotherapy, a community nurse specialists, uh, uh, consultants at, like Jane, psychotherapy and counselling like myself. Um, and, and we offer a sort of rapid response, fast track service for people who might be in crisis and, and wanting hospice at home. Um, we are linked up also with the Duchess of Kent, who do provide um, both res respite care in Reading and also a, a hospice provision, which is in-house. So um, we're still working very, very closely with those services as well. Um, as you can imagine, um, in the pandemic, a great deal of services shifted online. And I think like many, many healthcare professionals and palliative care professionals, you know, it, various sort of in, innovations emerged in that time, a sort of realisation of what people might need, because of, of course, the experience of caring for someone at home, and also the experience of bereavement at this time of pandemic has, has been really quite isolating for many people. So we've sort of provisionally set up online Line support groups um, for carers and people who are bereaved. So, um, and day therapies have also continued online. So people that might want to practice, you know, exercises in terms of physiotherapy and so forth. And I guess that at the moment we're in this transitional spec space of, of, of how, where do we go now and how, how is this going to actually sort of um, be implemented in the real physical world? So that's, sort of where we're at generally. Jane, do you think you could, is there anything we need to add? I think the interesting thing was that the drive initially for a move from an inpatient provision to community service was very much driven by the public view that they that people's preference in terms of their place of care is home. So can you somehow take that all singing or dancing hospice type model and can you transpose it and deliver the same sort of care and the same sort of quality without actually having to have a physical building for it to happen in and I think um, I think we've we've what the thing that was most important to us was that we kept the multidisciplinary element of it and that actually that the, the psychos spiritual aspects that that Esther brings were just as key as the medical and the nursing to make sure that we didn't dumb down what we delivered to be just simply um, a standard care provider in the community. It, ha it has, I think, and it needs to be more than that to really deliver what we're all wanting and what we're talking about today, which is a good death at home. It's, it can be a challenge, but it, it, it's a challenge that 
is achievable, providing you've got that range of um, you've got that skill mix that can be brought to bear when people need it and the flexibility to deliver it really, really quickly um, when things change. But those would be my initial thoughts. It might generate a few questions later. <laughs> hey there, Esther. Yeah. I am. I mean, I think probably I've sort of spoken slightly off the cuff, but, you know, which re which relates to the content of the slides, but I've, I've sort of whizzed through it. So, um, yeah, I think that's where we are in terms of services. I think there's an awful lot more to say in terms of, you know, things like the conceptualization of the good death how it applies in reality, what are the policy practice gaps and so forth that are well worth thinking about if we get space to do so today. But in terms of, you know, I guess what we're thinking of as a team, um, very thoughtfully, I think, as a group of, of practitioners, um, you know, is, is exactly as Jane says, how can we offer something approximating what, what was available um, within the actual hospice situation uh, to those who are in the community? Shall I go on to the, the last slide? Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is, you know, I, I you know, there is, I think what's so striking about about the work we do is that um, and I would come at it from this angle being a psychotherapist is that is that the the value of the relationships and the attachments which are formed, which I think, you know, are so sort of jarring at times with the kind of procedural ways that we think about things um, in current society, you know, generally speaking. Um, what always strikes me working very closely with our staff team is, is, is the quality of attuned care, the real thoughtfulness and how vital relationships are, you know, within a frame of trust to people towards the end of their lives. Um, you know, there's a real intimacy in being alongside people who are dying and their families. Um, you know, which um, I mean, all I can say is it's a it's a huge privilege to do the work, and I think most of my colleagues would would agree with me. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, so that brings us to just we could have maybe a brief question now. If uh, if anybody's got a, a quick question for Esther or Jane on on those points. I just wonder if I could make more of an observation just after sure. hearing what Esther was saying. Um, I think there's a, a tension for me as a GP um, in my kind of instinct as a human being versus what I can deliver as a busy, you know, primary care doctor. Um, and I, I agree with everything Esther was saying, and I hear those remarks and I can't help having the, the kind of a bit of pang of guilt really in, in recognizing that what I would like to deliver for my patients and what I'm able to deliver are not the same thing. Um, and it, it's, there's you know, lots of different parts of primary care that has that tension, but for palliative care in particular, it's, it's something that, you know, I think we're, we're all aware of that. We would all like to be doing more. We'd all like to be able to drop everything immediately and go and sit with that person for as long as they need, but, the reality is that it's tough. Um, I don't have any answers for that, but I, I just like to recognize that, sort of acknowledge that in general practice, we don't get it perfect, but we all were really trying, you know, um, but it's, it's not easy. I, I, and I think, you know, it's vitally important to acknowledge that, not least because services are so hugely under-resourced in so many areas. And so there is a reality in terms of the limitations of what we're able to do. It really, I, I guess the word perfection always slightly alarms me because I'm taken immediately back to the work of Donald Winnicott, who is a psychoanalyst, who talks about being good enough. Right. I think that sort of gives you the scope to let yourself slightly off, off, off the hook. And, you know, perhaps it is, you know, in terms of being multidisciplinary, you know, who can hold what for organisations? 
and rather than sort of taking it on in a, a, a sort of individualistically, if you like, it, it's about systems, isn't it? I right. think. I think that's Ordinary. absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and I think where things have gone less well, in my experience, is when there's been confusion about who's holding that at that moment. So an assumption that palliative care might be visiting tomorrow. So you you don't go and do that visit that lunchtime and then something breaks down and palliative care don't go and then it becomes GP didn't visit and mm. those sorts of situations can happen but I think that's that's just a reflection of the, the pressures every every part of the system is under. Mm. Can I just chip in there are two questions that have come up on the chat so one from Helen how can you access this support and is it available to West Oxfordshire and the second question is how do you get referrals so Esther, do you want to answer either of those? Jane, can I hand that you, over you can to you? Of, I just wanted to come back to something Ben said, if I may, before I try and answer those things. Firstly, is I, I, I mean, I work across quite a wide area with a, a wide range of um, primary care practices. And I'm always struck by how um, small um, contacts short contacts have often had really powerful um, effects for people in terms of feeling that somebody cared about them and that they were valued. And I think so often we want to do so, so much and we, we're so conscious about how long that will take us that the, um, we've, we may miss how valued even a phone call is or a, a brief visit or something which to us might seem relatively minor or, or even trivial so the, there's this sort of feeling that somebody still cares isn't there that we will have in us and that 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 when that comes from a GP it, it has a very profound effect um, on on the person the people I see and um, I, I can re I, I I love it when it happens. I love it for the people who know the, the GPs that know the history of, of the person's lives, maybe know about the family dynamics in a way that I'm kind of busy trying to scrabble around learning all at the 11th hour, but they've got that, that, that background. So the, 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 the small, even the smallest of contributions from GPs, I see, as, I, I see from families as being hugely appreciated and valued. So, so maybe we need to kind of sometimes be kind to ourselves and think even that little interaction gives uh, gives them something that is is very um, is very appreciated and 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 valued. Um, so, really nice observation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and and also what happens is I know the GPs who care. So there are some that really invest in in those patients, but their their investment isn't always necessarily about time. It's about it's about consistency, isn't yeah. it? It's, and that, that's what people seem to value. Um, so, I mean, the, going back to the question, Ron, the question was, how do you access these sorts of services? I mean, we all have referral routes and there are, you know, there are websites that give you those referral routes and there are, you know, either online referral forms or, or um, paper referral forms for it. But actually, we do also take self-referrals. Um, so if somebody phones through, and so, funnily enough, being part of a big charity organisation, sometimes people phone through to the big charity email addresses and then get passed on down to the local services. Um, and we would always make contact with those people. Um, we would then liaise with the other healthcare professionals um, before we maybe formally took them on to our books. But, but accessing support, I think, should be done it should be done in a really easy way. And I feel it should be done in an easy way for the pa patients themselves and their families. But I also think it needs to be easy for the professionals. I'm constantly um, uh, criticised, I think, for taking verbal referrals because actually I think it's often, if, you may, if it can be a slick for people to refer to you, you get used much more effectively. If we make the whole process so um, labour-intensive, for a lot of people, they're not going to see it through. So it needs to be a, a, an easy way to, to get help. And then it needs to be a fast response, actually, because although we might not re regard their need as being very urgent, for some people, it's taken a long time before they've presented with their need to people. So to them, it is urgent and it does need somebody to get back to them really quickly and tell them what they um, or offer them what they can do. Um, 
so the services are available in different forms in different areas. Every area has its own sort of um, strengths and it also probably has its own um, uh, weaknesses. And um, because I cover the across the patches, there's a different service that I work with in West Parks. And there's, there obviously is um, better access to beds because probably a bit like them, we've got a very active community hospital in West Parks. Um, which also takes patients for palliative care and to end of life. And it's got its own little charity that, that supports those, those beds. So there's a different setup, but the, the fundamental model of what we offer is the same. Um, and it's, it's trying to offer something which is very individualized for the person that, that brings the problems to you. And it's, it, it, the, the involvement is tailored to what, what a person would want in terms of whether that's medical or nursing or, or you know, family support or, or you know, allied health. It's very helpful, it's helpful. Jane. Um, um, and I think, it, you know, if anybody came to you and they were out, out of your area, you, you, you know, refer them to whoever could help, I assume. And I mean, the other thing is that you do tend to have quite good networks. So if somebody does come out of your area, you tend to know how to access for them what they might want in a different place. And similarly, people who have moved from one area to another, you know, you can say, well, I will make sure that what you've got gets passed on to the team that's, that you're moving to. And I can liaise with that team to make sure, you know, the information is is transferred across. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we tend to... I have the advantage of tending to know what neighbouring services do offer, and and that can be that can be, you know, helpful information for people. Right. I'll just stop sharing now because I'll have to bring up another set of slides. Can I thank you very much, uh, Esther, Jane, and also Ben's contribution on that. I'd like to introduce Min now, so I'm just going to see if I can. Um, get open Min's slides without it giving that pesky little warning. <laughs> we shall see what it does about uh, moving the thing away from the screen. Let's have a go. Yeah. Does everybody need to have the side slides or do you want to go into slideshow? Okay, we should be in slideshow okay. now. That's great. That's very good. Excellent. This slide is only interesting. I think Rhonda would let you have the slide. So it's only interesting because it has my email address on it. And if anybody wants more information, there it is. And also, since we started at the far end, just to let you know that there are just a, a, a few slides at the end, which I'm not going to go through, but they are both resources and, and references for the Namaste Care Programme, which is kind of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and, um, I'm aware that I don't work in your area and I don't actually know um, whether Namaste is familiar to any of you. Um, I was a palliative care nurse working with people with dementia and I became very worried really that I was quite good at helping people to die peacefully but not very good at helping them to live until they died. I didn't really have a sense of what that might be for people with, with very advanced dementia. Um, and I came across um, a book called The Namaste Care Programme by um, Joyce Simard, who's an American social worker. And it seemed to me to be the best answer I'd come across. <laughs> so Namaste, probably everyone knows it as, as, as a, a Hindu greeting. It was chosen as the name for this care program for the meaning to honor the spirit within. Um, I learned about Tom Kitwood from dementia, but, but it seems to me valuable for, for everything I've done in palliative care or in life. <laughs> um, and he, he um, identified the, the, the needs of, of, that people have throughout our lives um, to be loved and valued, to be physically and socially comfortable, to know who we are, to be respected and, and respected, to have meaningful activity. We're all busy people. Everybody's got something to do. And to be part of a, a family, part of, part of a, a community, part of the world, um, that everyone needs love. And this is true of all of us, whether from babyhood to, to old age. Um, and I think that people with advanced dementia are not able to meet their own needs. The next slide, Rhonda. 
thank you. This don't don't really trouble with this, but it was just really to point out that um, for people with dementia, really from the moment of diagnosis, the goals of their their care change, and initially they may be the maintenance of function, but from really quite early on in the dementia journey, the maximization of comfort, quality of life, really becomes the, the, the focus of, of all care. Um, thanks, Rhoda. And, and Namaste seems to me to, um, to meet the needs that Kit would identified and to um, allow us in, in a palliative care program to, to, to um, concentrate on quality of life. It, it's it's always best known for being sensory, for being music and massage and 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 chocolate ice cream. It's also physical and emotional, and it's also very much. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not new. It's just a, a, a bringing together of best best practice, um, and the two key elements really are creating a peaceful, welcoming, homely environment and the power of loving touch. Thanks, Rhonda. And this was a guy who, in a care home who, who, um, who walked continually. Um, I mean, they had to feed him walking in the corridor. Um, the first day that we did Namaste Care, he was drawn into the room, I think, by the scent and and by the music. And this was actually the director of the, the care home. But she managed to sit him down and to give him a hand massage. And he actually sat there and went to sleep only for a quarter of an hour. But that was such an enormous achievement. <laughs> um, thanks, Rhonda. Let's have the next slide. I think in our study at St. Christopher's, we found that the two most powerful elements were, were music and touch, and that hand massage was an incredibly valuable addition to all of our toolkits for, for connecting without speech with people who find it hard to, to communicate for whatever reason, really. I should say that, that Namaste was started as a, um, a care program in care homes, but there's a, a, a lot of um, work has been done with using Namaste individually. Um, St. Joseph's Hospice particularly have trained very many volunteers to work in individual homes and to train families to, to use the elements of the programme. Um, okay, next slide please, thanks. Um, yeah, within Namaste, I think the, the idea is the overwhelming idea is, is to make a connection. Um, the people that we were working with were really at the very end of their lives, um, but, but their lives didn't necessarily end. It's not really like cancer that, you know, there's, there's almost a statistical probability of when people will die. When people reach the end stages of dementia, very often there is a long, long period in which nothing much happens. <laughs> Um, except that they continue to deteriorate. And so it, it feels very important to engage them. Um, and that's what Namaste is about. It's not, a, it's not a program, it's not we do this, it's we try to find out what changes things for you. Um, this is an example of doll therapy, which please don't use unless you've read up about it. <laughs> but, but once you've seen it work, this lady cursed a lot of the time, but you can see that she is here totally engaged in control, giving love, you know, it, it was a very significant change for her. Um, so that, that connection and through, through people's life story, really, um, you know, she was a mother. Um, and it's not just about women either, you know, men, men will also respond often to, to a doll. Um, thanks, Jane. Yeah, Namaste is not just for the person with dementia. Um, it's also for family and friends. This lady had been in the care home for at least five years. She is um, 
was visited by her daughter two or three times a week, always. So she was very keen to know what we were doing. And once again, this is a picture from the first day of Namaste. Um, we were just using hand lotion to give people a hand rub. And she asked if she could join in. And of course, the idea is that, that family should be involved and that there should be family and volunteers in, involved. And uh, we turned away briefly while she was giving her mama a, a hand rub and turned back to find her in tears. And she said, my mother hasn't done, uh, my mother rubbed my hand back uh, and she hasn't done anything as a mother since she came to the care home. So even these two with their very close connection had found a new way to connect at this different stage in, in the dementia. Could we have the next slide, Jane? Yeah, so with Namaste, the, the entry to Namaste, however that comes, whether it's as an individual or as, as joining a, a care program in, in, a, in a care home, will involve talking with the family. And the, the question inevitably is why do they need this new care? And, and, and very often I think the problem with dementia is that people don't recognize end of life. They don't recognize the very slow changes that are, that are coming. And people need namaste because they can't any longer do a quiz or a sing-along. They need that very, that one-to-one -one approach. So it, it, it highlights the progression of disease, a change for the worse, but in a positive context because you're seeking the help of the family to honor the spirit within. What's the person's favorite music? You know, you're, you're, you're actually making it clear that at this stage in their life, the aims of, of care are comfort and pleasure. Um, so you have really a golden opportunity, which is very often missed. Not a lot of people do Namaste light, but you have this opportunity to open up a conversation early in the, the, the um, you know, person's end of life care around um, DNA CPR around preferred place of, of care and of death and and to establish that the ultimate goal is a peaceful dignified death um, and for people in care homes that will be uh, you know the the, the, the the home you know where, where they're cared for but it might also be the the person remaining at home to die um, and it gives family a lot of time really to think about that because they're not making crisis decisions. Thanks Jane. This is really just to show you that there is actually since our study in 20 published in 2014 but actually finished in 2012 there have been significant studies across the world. Um, the most recent is this study from Worcester which saw a statistically significant decrease in agitation and a statistically significant increase in, in quality of life. Um, but but that's you know been replicated now across the world in Australia, in Canada, in Singapore, in um, the trying to think Ireland. You know it's really it's really um, you know the, the the evidence is 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 rolling up very convincingly. I think. Um, and sorry, next slide. I, I, I'm always very interested, and I think to some great extent the 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 value of namaste lies in the impact on on care staff that that everyone liked it it was the care that everyone wanted to give um you know at the very least people really enjoyed just just being part of of sessions um you know and and it was noted that 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 quieter staff blossomed that that generally relationships improved and there was a better understanding of of well-being for residents so okay that's that's the brief answer. <laughs> there you go. There's a whole lot of resources and whatever, but if people want that, that perhaps they contact you for it, Rondo. Yeah, or me, whatever. <laughs> that's a good film, a really nice film. Try that. <laughs> uh, that's one seeing is believing. The film there. Oh, that's right. actually, yeah, excellent. Yeah. That's great. So I'll I'll share these slides as I said, and and thank you. Yeah, and people will have the recording as well. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Great. So, um, are, are there any uh, brief uh, questions for Min 
on namastic care and, and i'm aware that namastic care is not really known so much around the thames valley in, in my experience um, iceland so, tehran yeah. <laughs> yeah um it's interesting you know the way these ideas spread uh, where they get to and where they don't so um yeah that's great um okay i can't see anything coming up immediately Ron, in the chat Ron, Ron, may I ask a question? Go ahead. I'm, I mean, one of the things that I found really hard in this last year is that we've not been able to touch patients and families in the same way. And um, I think, for better or worse, and, um, I think the nature of what I do means I often do touch people and hold their hands. And there's something very symbolic. Sometimes I think about, you know, I, I want to support you in this. And it's a kind of it's, a, it's an act. It's an act of giving, isn't it, that you offer yourself and it's a physical thing as well as a practical thing and not being able to do it I've actually found really hard so for me personally it's been hard but I also wonder about what that impact has been for others um, and how incredibly isolating it is if you have no partner to touch you and then you aren't being touched because touch is no longer happening how how physically isolating it becomes and I just wonder what impact this last year has been for those programs i think it's been very very shocking really i mean i think you know we know that children who aren't touched fail to thrive it's i think it's the same for all of us all our lives you know some of us manage touch in different ways but i think we all have a very deep need for it um i i, I think in terms of programs you know, one of the, some interestingly, you know, one of the the um, aromatherapists at St Joseph said to me that actually she thought that the um, the lot when she wore gloves to massage, she thought that the loss was more to herself than to the person she was massaging. That that sometimes people didn't even seem to notice that she was wearing gloves. I think I think touch is always mutual. You know, you give but you receive, and that, you know I think that's that's an important part of it. I also think that that you know one of the things about Namaste is it brings out a lot of creativity in people, and people have been you know waving feather boas past people, and you know just you know popping um, um, bubble wrap, and just helping people to be tactile. But but I don't think anything really replaces human touch. You know it 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 just doesn't. But but you know care workers are all the time touching people very intimately. Um, and, and I think there is a, a great difference, actually, between that um, task-oriented touch um, and, and, you know, a, a, a touch which is intended to convey what words can't touch that is perhaps. We talk about being touched emotionally, don't we? Touched spiritually. And, and I, I, I remember a man who, in, in one of the care homes, who... Um, had been he was such a difficult man to 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 be with that he hadn't been included in in the namaste room before but the, the nurses felt more confident and they they brought him in and that afternoon they they were washing feet just just soaking feet in bowls of water or whatever and um, soaked put his feet in the water and he started to pray and he prayed for himself and he prayed for his family and he prayed for his church and he prayed for the world and he went on and on praying and he hadn't done that in the year that he had been there and you know the nurses asked what was going on when his daughter came in and and she couldn't think either but then she said I think that in his when he was a young man in Jamaica foot washing was part of the church ritual and and this was a good care home. I think he had been to the chiropodist. I am sure his feet were clean. But until his feet were washed in the spirit of honoring the spirit within, it hadn't triggered that, that spiritual memory for him. I, I, I think it's very remarkable, really. But it's the intention, I think, more than the... The actuality. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful example there, Min. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn now to the questions that people submitted in advance. We've, we've got six. I'm going to take them in reverse order um, to the way that they came in. And, and the first one is, what do you think are the common service shortfalls for people wanting to die at home? So what are the things that 
just don't happen that should be happening for people wanting to die at home? Who would like to come in on that? I'll pick on someone if no one volunteers. <laughs> Jane, I, I Jane. will. Yeah, go ahead. If you like. I, I think as a dementia advisor, it isn't having that conversation soon enough. And you, you, even for an advisor, you think, oh, well, you know, they're, they're, they're recently diagnosed or they're early stages. And maybe we'll have that further down the line. But actually, I've realized in our support groups, talking to carers, talking to people with dementia, having that conversation early, maybe doing the advanced statements, the advanced directives, really understanding what people want. And then I say, and then you can put it away you've had that conversation and 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 you can get on with your your future and your forward planning so for me it's recognizing that conversation needs to be had sooner rather than later where everyone can participate in it so thank you jane anyone else want to chip in my experience is be, my, my experience is that often when you offer that conversation people are very relieved to have it um it, it isn't always this sometimes the person wants it more than the family or the family wants it more than the person but the the fact that it's there's an opportunity to talk about it is um is something that they may not have asked been brave enough to ask for but they're pleased to to have it it offered to them and and i think uh, and i know it isn't available or isn't widely used across the whole of our patch but i do think that's where the respect tool has been a really big asset because to introduce the conversation where you say we want to document your wishes in a medical format that that actually is accepted by all the people who you're coming to contact with but we're doing it on a respect form the very title of the word respect i think is is in itself saying to them we want to respect what your wishes are and the respect form of course can be written for being all for very active treatment as indeed might be written for comfort and focus on quality so there's a kind of it's not it's not prejudice for this is what you're going to be saying as a result of that conversation it's kind of it's left open and it gives you free to go wherever the person may want so i i would agree with you uh, being brave enough to have that conversation to broach the offer so, you know, our, our responsibility is to offer it. It's an individual's to take it up if the offer's made. Um, so I think you're right. Unless you get that bit clear, so often it goes very, very wrong. Um, and people don't always end up with the services that they want or the care that they want in the way they'd like. Thank you. So it's both, both the Janes on the panel. Anybody else want to chip in before I go on to the next question? Min. Yeah. Just, just to reinforce, really, I remember a, a, just a very small piece of research um, at the Marsden where they, I think it was just 12 people that they, they asked about whether they'd like to talk about end of life. Um, and, and no one objected, absolutely no one. And, and I can't remember the numbers, but more than half, and particularly single women, um, were very anxious and very relieved to be allowed to talk about it. The, the, the reluctance seemed to come from professionals rather than from, from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. I agree, Min. I, at the first time I did it, I, you know, I was expecting to need boxes and boxes of tissues and, you know, to come out feeling very low and, and, and very sort of down. Actually, everybody in the group said, this is amazing. We, we feel we feel lighter. And there was actually, if you can understand, laughter in the conversation. It wasn't somber. Nobody burst into tears, which is what you assume will happen. But it actually, you're right, it doesn't necessarily go that way. You raise a really interesting point. Um, there are some practitioners in my field who are, you know, they're psychoanalytically trained and, um, they've recently published a book called the psychodynamic approaches to people uh, to the experience of dementia and there's a really beautiful essay in there which is about approaches approaching uh, advanced care planning from a kind of psychoanalytic perspective and so it's seen rather than as a sort of an activity of you know sort of box ticking and, and getting the wishes down and making the choices it's seen rather as an opportunity to 
to to tell the tell stories basically and and in some ways as a way to 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 repair they see it as a a reparative act um which i think is a really interesting way of looking at it and also as an opportunity to contain anxieties so it's sort of underpinning it all is this kind of uh, you know a real sort of emotional attention to the process um you know, which I think is really helpful in terms of shortfalls, and this is probably one of my my bugbears. Um, I watch staff who are going out as lone workers, and to Min's point, who are often practicing this extremely sort of intimate uh, work, which is incumbent with an, an enormous degree of emotional labour. And I think one of my sort of ongoing concerns is, you know, if we are expecting people to practice with this, you know, sort of um, real attunement, then the same attunement ought to be afforded to the staff team, you know, uh, you know, so that's that's something that always is ongoing in my mind. You know, there has to be a sort of real culture, which I guess is what Namaste is about. There have to be cultures of of, of real care and containment, you know. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Support for staff, care for the carers is absolutely paramount. That's great. Um, a, a specific question now. How do we support patients with delirium at the end of life at home? And how do we support the families to cope in that situation? So delirium at end of life at home and supporting the families to cope. What's your opinion? No. I expected to come in last, but I'll come go in on, first. If you like. in. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that all the, um, or, or, or everything which supports people with advanced dementia supports people who are cognitively impaired and and that is people who are um ha have a delirium um i mean I, you know it, it becomes incredibly complex and you know goes into terminal agitation and all the the the, the, the nightmare of that but i think that that you know very simple things like reducing the stimulus around making sure that people have continuity of care that there's always somebody with them, you know, using touch, using music, using whatever will work for them. Um, you know, that that's really my my only contribution. I'm not, uh, you know, in, in practice right now, but but um, you know that that that's I think something that I'm aware I could have done much better. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I think, well, my, my um, comment would be that we so often historically have just rushed for the medication and that the, the medication might um, potentially um, remove the problem for a short period of time. It doesn't deal with whatever's driving it. And, and yes, it's true. You always want to look at what may be driving it in terms of is there a reversible medical component that if you put right you'll you'll resolve the problem but you're still left with the problem for while they they've got that medical problem and how do you how do you manage it and and support people and and I do think I think there is something for us medics about not wondering what else we can do other than just give sensitive medication um, and you know there's lots of work now that suggests that sometimes that sedative med medication itself is not really the right thing to do either and and I'm kind of comforted in a way by the way in acute care there's more information for people out there particularly for families about what it is and how to support the person with it and the approach that's that's taken because it is so often little things that trigger it and if you can remove those those little things um it you know, it's like the clock on the wall and the lights not being suitable. And, you know, you, you you think for somebody who's got visual impairment, how they can misinterpret things that are their environment. And the, in misinterpreting it, they, they, they trigger memories, which can be very deep rooted and very traumatic. So I think there's something about we need to create that environment that's, that's minimizing those risks. Um, but also be mindful as to what it is that's driving the the, the 
or what what maybe is the the emotional memory that's being triggered that is causing the distress and and that's where i do think that if we get that opportunity as all of us as individuals to work through some of the things that have traumatized us in our lives so that we we've more we've got more insight to them we maybe stand a better chance of not then getting very distressed if we're in an environment where we're we're finding that you know our the 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 environment is is triggering us and maybe our our medical health is also trigger, triggering um delirium it is it's it's a it's a really difficult problem and i think to suggest it's not um it, it is is not is misleading actually but but trying to find a way through it is also immensely rewarding and simply sitting beside somebody may be enough to stop it um you know, I've I've seen that. You know, just simply somebody choosing to write their notes beside the person who was struggling with their delirium, rather than write their notes at a distance. That in that act alone is is enough to defuse the the the, the behaviour that that's going on. So there are real opportunities to make a difference, but they're not necessarily the obvious ones, and they need a kind of bit of lateral thinking to to maybe um, think of them. Thank you, Jane. That's great. Um, I'm just looking at what might be a good one. Dying at home is often a wish for many people. Practical support is often available, but there appears to be little emotional or psychological support for carers. What can be done to address these needs? So the emotional and psychological support for carers and caring for someone dying at home. Just wondering, is that one for Esther or for Jane Probitz? Any, any, any thing that you can suggest there? Well, I mean, in terms of our service, we offer ongoing uh, one-to-one uh, counselling or psychotherapy, you know, through the trajectory of, of dying and that thereafter, and also facilitate um, a carers group. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can underestimate the, 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 the intensity um of what might get stirred up when you're alongside someone who's dying um you know there's all sorts of things that come into play difficult relationship dynamics which might have pre-existed an illness um one thing that always strikes me is that you know culturally i think we've got a bit of a fear of dependency not a bit, a lot of a fear of dependency. And um, many of us carry that as individuals. And so, you know, when we're caring for someone who's becoming increasingly dependent, I think what ordinarily gets us uh, evoked in people is their own sort of worries about becoming a dependent other themselves. Or indeed, if our own earliest experiences of being dependent on a primary caregiver has been wobbly and unreliable, I think something gets provoked that it's very, very difficult then to be alongside someone um, because you're reminded of that each, each day. And I think, you know, if we're thinking about the experience of dementia, very often the role dynamics, they completely flip over. And a, and, a, and a caregiver becomes a kind of, you know, a parental figure. And so, you know, that can be extraordinarily dislocating for people. So I do think there's, it's really important that people have a space to be able to, to slow down, I think, in some way, to be able to process what's going on internally in their own experience. Um, and also to be, you know, to, I think there's something about, we can be very, very harsh on ourselves when we're looking after someone. And I think Ben used the word, you know, you want to do it perfectly. And that, you know, there's something that we, we end up, you know, very often wanting for people we love that, that the experience is a perfect one you know you know the caregiver also is human and has foibles and so there's something about how do we compassionately think about what what you know what's needed what's going on for both people I mean in in London in the Tavi there's a really um, lovely project going on which is about supporting relation partners 
with dementia, you know, and offering the partnership psych couple counseling, you know, effectively. But, you know, there's something about how do we all relate to one another with sensitivity so that we sort of stop these kind of defensive interactions. And when we're having a really hard time, we're able to say so. Um, and that that's not, we're not shamed into silence about those things somehow. Um, there's a related question here, which is how do you deal with not providing a good death for a family member? So I think, you know, it's just that sort of feeling of guilt that you haven't done everything yeah. you could have done, you know, and, and so seek support. Support is available. See, I think so. And I think one of the things that always occurs to me is in most human relationships, you know, there's ambivalence. It's very, very hard to consistently retain a loving stance. And so there has to be space to also think about and process those more difficult feelings, you know, ones of aggression, ones of disgust. And I think when someone has had the space to encounter that in themselves, actually it refuels you to go back and continue the caring. So that's whether you're a, a family carer or a professional carer. And if we don't talk about things like that, that's where the difficulties ensue in a way it gets acted out it leaks out and so um yeah support ask for help ask for help absolutely jane probert did you want to come in on that yeah it, it it for me as well is the asking for help and also i find you know the, the wife might say well you know we're prepared he's older he has dementia he's obviously going to go first and he's made his will and then you have to sort of unpack, well, that's after he's gone. What about before? And have you actually considered that you might be the one to go first? And have you made plans for your other half? Because they don't. They just have this sort of trajectory that they think they're going to go along. And, and, and yeah, he'll go, he'll go before me. And then when the unforeseen happens that is incredibly difficult because there is no plan B. So I spend a lot of time getting people to explore all the avenues. You know, have we thought of this? What would you do if this happened? Or you had to go into a home or, you know, and I think it's important to be quite open in these, in these discussions and, and really explore the whole, the whole topic. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to pick one last question because we're, we're out of time. Um, what other options are there to dying at home was a question that was put to us as sort of if for whatever reason, you know, there's no support at home or the normal care is not available, hospice places, what, what are the options who can help on this? Um, I'm happy to answer it, but also Ben highlighted at the start that um, in a sense, there are a range of different care settings and, and you might want to add in then. Sure. Um, I mean, the community hospital that I, I work in does a lot of, uh, looks after a lot of people at end of life. And quite often they are people who, for whatever reason, haven't got family that can look after them and support them. Um, or the family are at an age where they might want to, but they 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 can't. So I do think then there there's the need for alternative settings. But I mean, if we think about ourselves as an aging population, care homes deliver a lot of end of life care. Statistically, we know that you know the law of averages that, that there's going to be a lot of deaths within the first year of being in a care home. So I think um, being able to have a good death in a range of settings is a really important thing for us. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, the care home I look after um, certainly admit people for specifically end of life care, um, not just in dementia, but other whatever their underlying cause, there may be a range of things. Uh, I'm just thinking about what we have in Oxford City. We're quite lucky because we've got um, hospital at home that can support palliative care with the more me medically complicated stuff. So things like, um, you know, symptomatic pleural effusion or just recurrent ascites, that sort of thing that's quite difficult medically and probably a bit beyond the scope of what, what I'd be able to manage at home that can keep people at home and offer a more um, sort of fluid access to secondary care if they do need admission or or redirecting to community hospitals um 
but I don't think there's a kind of right or wrong answer about where one should um, die, uh, providing it's done in discussion with the family and the patient, ideally, obviously, some, some patients might want to die in hospital, and that's absolutely acceptable if that's what they would like to do. Um, there are scenar scenarios where you know that really plan A was to die at home, but for whatever reason, it's just not going to work that way. And I think you just, you know, like all things in life, you have to be pragmatic and and, and talk to everyone that's involved in that in that patient situation. Um, the only thing I would add, just from a GP point of view, and some because I work in the out of hours service as well, um, the importance of of, of sharing a a medical summary or care plan summary, whatever it's called local, locally to where you are between in hours and out of hours. Um, we have something called a special note that we can share with our out of hours colleagues. And that's really, really helpful when things happen at four o'clock on a Sunday morning as they inevitably do. Um, it's, and I see it as from both sides. I do that in my Monday to Friday work, but on a Saturday morning, you, you often get a scenario where, and it's usually a daughter will visit their mum and find them in a, a pickle on a Saturday morning and you'll look in the notes and find no documentation about the end of life plan or no uh, thinking ahead about anticipatory medication when it's quite obvious that that was the trajectory. Um, so from a practical point of view, if any any of the audience are involved in that um, decision making about well, what will happen at the weekend, because it will happen at the weekend, um, just think ahead and how will that pan out because it just makes life so much easier if the district nurses have got the direction to administer for example and it isn't just left to be sorted out for a Sunday evening um, and then the family are not in that awful sense of uncertainty where you know it looks like someone's kind of dropped the ball it's not a great look for the service um, so that that would be my only kind of take home message on a practical level. Thank you very much, Ben. So we are definitely out of time now. Can I thank all the panel members, uh, Dr. Jane Bywater, Dr. Ben Gooch, Jane Probritz, Esther Ramsey-Jones, and then Stackpole, and uh, helping in the background, Joe Brett from Oxford Brooks University. Also thanks to Maureen Cundell and Laura Myers uh, for their help in setting this event up. Um, I'm Rhonda Rianchi, I'm signing off, and I wish you all a very good rest of the Dying Matters Awareness Week. Do check out the rest of the events that are on, have a look at the Dying Matters site, and I'll send around the link to the recording when it's done. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Rhonda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night.